make it blue, <laughs> make it pink. I have a pimple patch, you can probably see it. Um, it's not very Sleeping Beauty of me, but it was literally bleeding and that's not cute, so I needed to cover it. I'm really excited because I've been wanting to do this video for a while now. I didn't have to wear this costume for the video, but I already had the costume and I was like, I may as well. I, was, I don't really know what I'm going to title this, but whatever the title says, it does suggest that Disney Sleeping Beauty is gothic. I'll explain how and why I made the connection. In my mukbang video a few months back, I keep wanting to delete that video by the way, I just, I don't know. But I'm acknowledging it. If at some point that video was not there, I'm just saying I might have deleted it. Anyway, I did mention in that video that I was going to be taking a gothic literature course and I was excited about it and I do have to say it was a really good class. I did enjoy it. <laughs> um, I passed with an 89.8B. I would have probably gotten an A but when I was taking the final quiz I took it for some reason really really early in the morning and <laughs> I was like I was tired and I was like I'm just gonna rest my eyes for couple of seconds I had enough time I was like I'm just gonna you know fell asleep fell asleep I woke up and the test closed out but my score was like 70 out of 80 and I was like you know that's like an 87 I'll take it you know my grade was already pretty good in the, the course if I was struggling you know I would have read there was a second attempt option and if I was doing really badly I would have taken it but I decided that um, you know, this is just fate and I'll just take what I got. But anyway, so gothic. When we think about gothic, we think of like, at least for me, I think of black, people that like to wear black, people that like to listen to gothic music. I would say most of us are aware of the gothic tribe that was in Europe a really long time ago. There has to be a connection, you know? Personally for me, I'm a very curious person. Like I have a question, I go to Google immediately. So I kind of always wondered what the connection between gothic and like gothic and the gothic tribe, like where was the connection? I thought there had to be a connection because same name, but how could it possibly like, where where does that come from you know and wait but oh there it is and turns out this is why it's not all just thanks to this book but this book does have a lot to do with how we think of or what ended up becoming gothic yes this is the seed that planted and out out from this sprouted a whole bunch of stuff so this was written in the 18th century and gothic is essentially an invention of the 18th century, the Enlightenment era. But before I really like get into the Enlightenment era, let's travel way, way back in time to when the Gothic tribe existed. So 6th century historian Jordanes, who was presumably of Gothic descent, wrote the Gedica as a summary of a much larger account by Cassiodorus of the origin and history of the Gothic people. Cassiodorus's work did not survive, but Jordanes did, which is why the Gedica is so crucial to Gothic history. The Gedica's credibility and accuracy is iffy because there is some myth mixed in, However, in the Gedica, according to Jordanes, the Goths came from an island called Skanza, which is Scandinavia. So Jordanes writes, the same mighty sea has also in its Arctic region that is in the north a great island named Skanza, from which my tale, by God's grace, shall take its beginning. For the race whose origin you ask to know burst forth like a swarm of bees from the midst of this island and came into the land of Europe. This claim that the Goths came from Scandinavia is reflected in archaeological record, though the evidence is not entirely clear. However, rather than a mass migration of a people, if the claim the Goths hail from Scandinavia is true, the migration would have been slow and gradual. According to Jordanes, 
Gothic Skanza was the first settlement after the Goths migrated from Skanza. Scholars generally place Gothic Skanza in the area of the Wheelbark culture, which developed in what is now Poland. The Goths are generally believed to have been first recorded by Greco-Roman sources in the first century under the name Gutones. My brain keeps wanting to say Gutones, Gutones, and I know that's not right. It cannot be right. Around 15 AD, Strabo mentions the Butones, Lugi, and Semnones as part of a large group under the Marcomannic king Marobodus. The B in Butones is considered to be an error. In 77 AD, Pliny the Elder mentioned the Butones as one of the peoples of Germania, and in 98 AD, Tacitus wrote about the Butones. He wrote, Beyond the Lugi are the Gothones or Gutones, who live under a monarchy somewhat more strict than that of the other German nations yet not to a degree incompatible with liberty. It's worth noting that the connection between the Goths and the Gutones aren't supported universally by scholars and historians. It's debated. Around the third century, the Goths began to invade Roman territory, and this is in part due to the fact that the Huns were coming into their territory and like pushing them into Rome. And there's other factors as to why they were getting pushed into Rome that I will not get into because again, I'm not a historian. This led to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. When the Goths, led by the Gothic king Alaric, sacked the Western Roman Empire in 410, they destroyed much of the classical architecture and art. So what does this have to do with anything? The Enlightenment saw a rise in appreciation for classical architecture, art, Greece, Rome, the classical world, in other words, um, and this appreciation became known as neoclassism. Hi, I realize that there's a whole other syllable in the word neoclassicism, and I kept saying neoclassism, so I'm just here to clarify, like, I know. Also, my hair is much different. It's been a while since I actually recorded this video because I recorded this video when I was in school like when my summer semester was like like when I was right in the middle of it actually right in the beginning I would say and um yeah summer semesters like I've never taken one before like they cram everything in so quickly because it's like a shorter semester so like they want you to get like done and it was crazy but now I'm actually working on this video again and just like making improvements and stuff but I just wanted to include this and like because it's just I'm hearing <laughs> I, like, I'm hearing myself say neoclassism and it's just like, it's bothering me. So I just want to clarify. I know that it's neoclassicism. Neoclassicism, you can see in a lot of like older houses and buildings. Neoclassicism was a cultural movement that developed alongside the Enlightenment era and it permeated art, literature, architecture, etc. This newfound interest was inspired by the discovery of sites like Pompeii, and this new intrigue spread across Europe, particularly when wealthy European art students returned home from their grand tour. So the stark contrast between the Gothic and the classical can clearly be seen if you look at the just architecture alone side by side. The difference is very apparent. The Gothic was considered the antithesis to the, you know, Greek and Roman world. Compared to the Roman and Greek world, um, the Gothic was harsh and dark and even barbaric. The Goths' um, negative perception began even way before, honestly, the Enlightenment era. In 1550, Giorgio Vasari claimed that Gothic architecture was monstrous and barbaric, wholly ignorant of any accepted ideas of sense and order. 
that's harsh. <laughs> Despite the bad PR, towards the late 18th century, people particularly in England um, started viewing the Goths a little differently. They were still like barbaric heathens, definitely were not considered refined. However, they were the barbaric heathens that, you know, defied the great Roman Empire. Neoclassical ideals are in part what many people saw as causing many of the revolutions in the 18th century, and they themselves were also dealing with political and economic upheaval. Britain's two opposing parties of the 17th and 18th centuries heavily disagreed on the extent of the powers of the monarchy. The Tories were royalists, whereas the Whigs feared tyranny and opposed absolute monarchy. To the Whigs, who wanted to limit the power of the monarch, the ancient Goths symbolized a rejection of tyrannical rule, so the Whigs incorporated Gothic ideals into their way of thinking. Plus, with uprisings around the world and a rise in secularism, there was a desire to look back at the ancient Goths, who were sort of mystical, magical. However, at the same time, the Goths were seen as a more primitive, simple people. Basically, from this, the Gothic became a representation of all these mixed feelings, terror, anxiety, apprehension, fear, but also nostalgia for another time. Horace Walpole, author of this wonderful piece of art. <laughs> really, I'm, I'm being unfair. It's not... It's it's interesting in parts, but he's the author of The Castle of Otranto. He is credited for creating the first gothic novel. The gothic has always been a political genre since its inception. Walpole's novel shows a desire to embrace the gothic principles that the Whig party of the British Parliament used to fuel their ideology. Walpole was a member of the Whig party and he clearly had a political agenda with at least the setting and the setup of the Castle of Otranto. Walpole sets up the story as being found in the library of an ancient Catholic family in the north of England. He writes, it was printed at Naples in the black letter in the year 1529. I have Oxford World's classic book version, and we find the notes. Nick Groom, he explains that Walpole matches Northern English Catholicism with the Southern remoteness of Catholic Naples, while also invoking the Visigothic heritage of Italy. The black letter refers to Gothic typeface. So Groom also notes that he mentions Hamlet. So Hamlet's comments on the murder of Gonzago. Gonzago? I've never read Hamlet. I gotta read it. I'm taking a Shakespeare studies class this summer. So Hamlet comments, the story is extant and writ in choice Italian. So like Shakespeare, Walpole suggests that Mediterranean politics are passionate and murderous. By doing this, he subtly challenges the prevalent 18th century antiquarian taste for the classical culture of imperial rome and the neoclassical renaissance people like walpole and people of the Whig party were wanting to move away from the fascination with classical antiquity and wanted to embrace what they identified as their own history they viewed the goths and english history as like one and the same so basically the story is a story in a story, which is a very common trope for gothic literature. Um, Frankenstein, Dracula, Carmilla, they are all like kind of stories within a story. By doing this, gothic writers, they heighten the otherness. It's kind of like distancing themselves also from the story. Like they can put like the craziest stuff in the story, but it's a it puts a distance between the author and what they're writing. So Sleeping Beauty definitely utilizes this trope of a story within a story. Not purposefully though, because <laughs> um, early Disney movies do it a lot, especially the princess movies where it opens to like a storybook. You have something like this. I bought it yesterday at um, Disney Springs. I saw it and I was like, I have to have it. And it's not because of this video. It's a journal. So like, it just caught, and there was a ton 
of like story looking book type journals um but I just saw this because I like it I like it a lot I feel like this is looking like I'm the biggest sleeping beauty stan and I mean I was as a child I was I'm not However, this is looking suspicious. It's starting to look a little suspicious. I do love the movie though. I think it's beautiful and I love the music. Anyway, so yeah, Sleeping Beauty utilizes the trope. You know, it opens on a storybook, but that's definitely not intentional. However, I'm using it because I can. So the actual narrative of the Castle of Otranto, it takes place in Italy, where um, literally in the first page or two, it might even be on the first page, Conrad, the son of Manfred, Prince of Otranto, is killed by a giant helmet. Um, literally smushed like a bug. Basically, there's a prophecy that states the castle and lordship of Otranto should pass from the present family whenever the real owner should be grown too large to inhabit it. And that's a like funny, it's not even subtle. It's very in your face, too large to inhabit it. A giant helmet crushes the heir to the throne. So um, after his son is killed, in order to avoid the prophecy, Manfred decides that he is going to marry a person that would have been his daughter-in-law. So because of that, there's an element of incest, and <laughs> that's unfortunately a another common trope in Gothic literature. Um, Manfred attempts to assault Isabella, um, but a specter distracts him. And it allows as Isabella as it allows Isabella to flee, and Manfred pursues her throughout the castle. She runs through like the dungeons, I think, essentially. But the rest, it's really hard to explain the rest of the story without getting all into it. I'm really horrible at explaining plots, but it's a big like, <laughs> what the fuck is happening? And it's not scary nowadays. The story is not considered scary at all. However, at the time, it was like. The scariest thing to have ever come out. The poet Thomas Gray actually told Walpole that Otranto made some of us cry a little and all in general afraid to go to bed oh nights. <laughs> oh nights. Walpole would later say that the novel was meant to be satirical, so some eventually turned on the book after this revelation, but that did not stop the novel from becoming so impactful. However, the Gothic did not develop solely from Walpole and Walpole's story. Robert Miles in the Gothic aesthetic, the Gothic as discourse, says the Gothic was a shift in aesthetic paradigms. The point is just that while Walpole was not the sole creator of the Gothic, many of the elements that he used would become a staple to the genre. The castle, the supernatural elements, and especially the element of terror are all things that he established. So now that the context is set, what makes the gothic genre gothic? The gothic is strangeness in the ordinary. Psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, he wrote an essay on the uncanny. He wrote that the uncanny is undoubtedly related to what is frightening, to what arouses dread and horror, think, you know, Uncanny Valley. Taking what Freud said, um, take for example, so after years of not being able to conceive a child, a couple finally conceives a child, and the baby is born, and she is everything they could have ever wanted, a celebration proceeds to welcome the new baby, and friends and family are invited to the house, to admire the newborn. Gifts are bestowed upon the baby and everyone is happy. Everything is going well until suddenly the doors to the house blow open with a gust of wind, lightning strikes, everything goes dark, and in the spot where the lightning hit, a woman appears in a burst of green flames. The woman, upset at not being invited, curses the baby. Now you have this anxiety and worry for 16 years that your child will one day prick her finger on a spinning wheel and fall into a sleep-like death. The gothic takes what is familiar, um, what is comfortable, and adds an element, something to defamiliarize that. Some more specific elements of the gothic So in Gothic literature, plots are organized around 
um, the anxieties and uncertainty of like good and evil, vice, virtue, sexual freedom, sexual repression. In Sleeping Beauty, I would say there's a clear binary of good and evil. That's most, most Disney movies. Well, specifically the older ones, there was a more black and white, good and bad. I would say now they're getting a little bit more where there's a gray area. Well, you have like Frozen where Prince Han is very clearly evil, kind of a weak evil, but evil. But then you have Elsa, but she's not evil, she's just going through something. Sleeping Beauty has a very clear good and evil. Most Disney movies do have a clear cut and dry villain, although we're getting less of that now. I would like to see, I want a good villain, you know, I want a good villain with a good villain song. We have not had that in a long time, and I would like that. I'm demanding that, actually. Disney, give me a good villain song. That's all I need. Philip is very clearly the good. You could also argue um, the fairies, but Philip, his like knight in shining armor, he even has a white horse. He is very clearly like the symbol of good, and Maleficent is very clearly the symbol of evil. In these like binaries, like good and evil, there's some sort of commodity. And in that, oftentimes it's women, um, especially in early Gothic novels. A lot of the times women are, they're used in the plot for something. And that's very clearly what Aurora is. She's, you know, a lot of people, me included, <laughs> have thought how Aurora is so not present in the movie, though it's called Sleeping Beauty, but she's kind of just a commodity for the real, character, the real protagonist, who's Phillips. It's kind of Phillips' movie. Without her, there would be no movie. You know, she helps, her predicament helps drive the movie, but it could be any other girl. <laughs> in the past, going into the gothic romantic era. I haven't read many gothic novels from now, but I'm sure that they also comment on um, society. As the gothic genre was being developed, revolutions like the French Revolution were in progress, and the French Revolution had a major impact on the English gothic novel. It was a very violent and chaotic time, and it disturbed the natural order of things. Anne Radcliffe is another prominent Gothic writer responsible for The Italian and The Mysteries of Udolpho. In Radcliffe's The Italian, the main female character triumphs over her hardships by marrying, though she marries upwards, and into a socially advantageous marriage. Aurora is a princess and she grows up a peasant, but she's a princess. So, and you know, of course, when Aurora meets Philip, she doesn't know that he's a prince and he doesn't know that she's a princess and they don't know that they're actually per like betrothed either. Like they don't know that they're supposed to be married. But in the end, when they do get married, you know, everything is right in the world. Like everything is set right um, socially and economically. <laughs> So the gothic genre is, or began as a lamentation of the chivalric code of conduct prominent in the Middle Ages. There is often a damsel in distress, and obviously Aurora is a damsel, as I said. She pricks her finger and she falls into a sleep-like death, and Philip must go through all these trials and tribulations to save her. <laughs> The gothic genre obviously explores the darkest aspects of humanity. You particularly start to see psychology become more prevalent in the gothic genre around the 19th century, late 19th century with the advent of psychotherapy, psychoanalysis. My 12th grade AP psychology knowledge tells me that Sleeping Beauty is a self-fulfilling prophecy, a self-fulfilling prophecy story. You know, after Maleficent curses Aurora as a baby, her family, her parents do everything they can to prevent the curse from being fulfilled. But regardless of what they do, it just ends up happening anyway. <laughs> So the supernatural is more than just for shock and value, though it can be just for shock and value. The supernatural can help plot. Castle of Otranto, the 
ghosts or the supernatural elements, they stop things from happening and help the victims of the story. But the supernatural also just aids with that element of anxiety and the feeling like you have lost control. You know, when you're against like a vampire, a witch, a demon, what have you, an evil fairy, for example, you feel helpless. Supernatural elements don't even really have to be supernatural. They can be explained. And Radcliffe's work did this pretty much all the time, as far as I'm aware. I haven't read all of her stuff, but that's what she became known for. And actually, some people didn't like that because they felt like it was kind of, wasn't very rewarding, I guess. But her style of explaining the supernatural is what many female gothic writers became known for at that time. The supernatural element in Sleeping Beauty, of course, are the fairies. However, uh, Maleficent is the evil entity. She's the aggressor. She's the one that's causing the fear and anxiety in the story and amongst the characters. This might be an odd element to bring up. I mentioned Gothic architecture earlier in reference to the Goths, but architecture is so important to Gothic, to the Gothic genre, um, particularly in early renditions. In the 18th century, Gothic architecture was considered grisly, harsh, and it brought a sense of dread with it. The sublime is beyond comprehension, and with that we experience terror. So terror. The gothic plays with the element of terror, but it also plays with the element of horror, and you would think that horror and terror are synonymous, but in gothic literature the two are not the same and they act very differently. Terror is the fear of death, um, the fear of the unknown, obscurity, things that are beyond our comprehension, like the vastness and infinitude of the universe. Horror, on the other hand, relates to being shocked by something, um, so in essence, horrified. I found a blog called The Gothic Library, and they mentioned something very interesting, and they said that there's like this distinction in today's scary movies. You can see the uh, terror and horror divide, like slasher films or body horror, like um, The Human Centipede, you're horrified by that. It's gross to look at, um, it's shocking. But then you have things like psychological thriller where it's hard to comprehend, you can't wrap your mind around it. Like I've heard people say that The Shining is not very scary, but if you watch it and like it's hard to comprehend some of the things that are going on, that's what makes it terrifying. Or sometimes there's a mixture of both. Anne Radcliffe wrote an essay titled On the Supernatural in Poetry where she defines the difference between terror and horror. So she argues that terror and horror are so far opposite that the first expands the soul and awakens the faculties to a high degree of life, the other contracts, freezes, and nearly annihilates them." So it is possible that this definition from Radcliffe was meant to kind of poke at one of her uh, peers in the genre, Matthew Lewis. His work, The Monk, was considered to be like one of the most graphic gothic novels of that time, and Miss Radcliffe was apparently not very pleased. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, she didn't like that, um, and I guess she didn't like where the genre was going, so she definitely would not like the human centipede, that's for sure. Anyway, back to the whole sublime thing. So, um, the sublime is basically awe-inspiring. Um, it's a feeling that creates mood and atmosphere, which is very important to the gothic genre. Obviously, a dark atmosphere. Like, I have a collection of Edgar Allan Poe's poetry, um, short stories. Every time it's like, rainy or something I want to read it. Can you find the element of the sublime in Sleeping Beauty? Definitely for sure. Um, Maleficent when um, as she attempts to stop Philip from saving Aurora there's like a wall of thorns and then when she finally of course turns onto the dragon that's like the main event and it's magnificent you know she's breathing fire and she's kind of beautiful um, but she's also trying to kill Philip so it's scary. It's terrifying. Well, it's terrifying for Philip. So I tried to tie in some elements of the gothic as I listed it 
with um, Sleeping Beauty, but you might still be wondering what really alerted me to the idea that Sleeping Beauty is gothic. I will, I shall explain further. So at first it was, I think the architecture, honestly, um, at first it was the architecture for me. And then I began to consider the chivalric aspect and the fact that Aurora is a damsel. You know, in a lot of the older Disney princess movies, Sleeping Beauty, you could argue that Cinderella is a damsel, although, I mean, I don't know. Cinderella gets crapped on a lot for being weak, but I actually really like her and I like her movie, so whatever. But yeah, a lot of Disney princesses can be termed a damsel, but it's not always a princess saving her. You know, you got mice sometimes. Sleeping Beauty is where it's very clear that she's a damsel. She's saved by Philip, who's like a medieval knight on a white horse with his shield and his sword coming to save his princess who's in danger. When I came to that realization, I immediately wanted to make a video. I obviously very clearly enjoyed my gothic literature course and I was just like making the connection. I was like, you know, it's super gothic. You know, even if nobody sees this video, like maybe 10 people see this video, I just wanted, I just wanted to talk about it so badly. I wasn't sure if any viewer noticed this connection and so I went to Google and I typed Disney Sleeping Beauty is gothic into Google. I got nothing except something about a play and a blog post that I will be referring to very soon. So Sleeping Beauty is set in around like 14th century France, so medieval. The architecture of late 14th century France would undoubtedly be gothic and even someone who knows nothing about history or architecture, if I tell you right now to think of a medieval castle in Europe, what your brain pops into your head is probably gothic architecture because they just go hand in hand. When you watch Sleeping Beauty, it's obviously very medieval, like that's obviously what their attempt was. But what really, really struck me was Maleficent's castle, especially the dilapidated, decaying atmosphere of it. Uh, like I said, gothic architecture is an aspect of the gothic, but particularly ruined castles because ruined castles reflect the destruction, the gothic tribe inflicted on Rome when they destroyed it. But apparently animators working on Sleeping Beauty knew that they would be going in a more gothic route. According to a blog post I found on artdocentprogram.com, on the VHS tape for Sleeping Beauty, the animators discussed how both they and Walt Disney wanted the film to feel markedly different than Snow White and Cinderella, the two princess films preceding Sleeping Beauty. So they conducted extensive research into medieval paintings, manuscripts, and architecture to make Sleeping Beauty feel much more medieval than either of the previous princess films. The animators say that the film's focus was decidedly pre-Renaissance, mostly gothic. Just the gothic aesthetic inspiration extends further than just the architecture, the clothing of characters, and furniture and things like that. But in the forest scene when Aurora and Philip are dancing, animators looked at pre-Renaissance Northern European art as well and incorporated the extreme attention to detail found there. Animators listed pieces like Van Eyck's, Van, Van Eyck's The Ghent Altarpiece and The Hunt of the Unicorn Tapestries as influences to their art in Sleeping Beauty. I think part of why I do like Sleeping Beauty so much and why I liked so much as a little girl is just how pretty it is. But so much of Disney's 2D animation movies are absolutely gorgeous. I think that's also why I like Cinderella so much. When they're all going to the castle, like when Cinderella pulls up to the castle, it's so beautiful. Like, it's so, so beautiful. I love Disney uh, very much, but I do not like how they've kind of treated 2D animation like it's thing of the past and like it's not advanced enough. Like, you know, 3D animation, computers, technology, the future. Now there's something very nostalgic about it because it feels so much in the past because they don't do it anymore. But I love 2D animation and I wish they would do more of it. The artwork is so rich that the film was shot in 70 millimeter film, a bigger size than used in any other Disney film to show the scope of the art. So yeah, like I said, I was obsessed with Sleeping Beauty when I was a little girl. I had thought I didn't know why, but I do know why now. Pretty, pretty music. Aurora was, Aurora was my favorite princess. Now I would say it's Rapunzel, just because I feel like 
I'm, I feel like I'm the most similar to Rapunzel, but I could be wrong. I should take a Disney princess quiz to find out. Even though I have a princess that I like, I really like them all and I like all the movies. I'm a huge Disney fan. I guess I'm a Disney adult, but I don't think I'm a Disney adult to the point of annoyance. I would hope not. But I can control myself. I can control myself on a lot of things. Like I like K-pop and stuff, as you can see, but everything in moderation. <laughs> when I was in high school, I was really depressed. There was a point where I was really, really depressed. And I would watch Disney movies, especially the princess movies, to um, just make me feel better. The music, the animation, it was a way to like self-soothe in a way. It helped me to relax. I don't know why. That just is a method that worked for me. I would have really benefited from having Disney Plus at that time. But yeah, um, I'm getting near the end of the video, obviously. But I really enjoyed doing this. I enjoy applying what I studied. <laughs> in a video. I do want to watch a Sleeping Beauty movie so I will be doing that after this. Whenever this video goes up the next video will be me watching Sleeping Beauty. Obviously the gothic aesthetic has changed so much over time. Gothic romance or the gothic romantic era like Mary Shelley, you know Frankenstein. I think that's when, I think that's when and where the gothic maybe was taken a little more seriously. If you want to learn more about the gothic I'll put resources down below. I try to do my best to explain the gothic on a very surface level. I really enjoyed doing this. I really enjoyed applying what I learned to something that's something that I like, um, a movie that I really like. And I was considering, because I was reading Dracula, and I really freaking enjoyed Dracula, I was considering maybe doing a video on Dracula and watching those movies. There's um, the 1930s one, and then there's the ones, I mean, there's a ton of Dracula movies, but the three that I wanna see, the 1930s one, the one with Christopher Lee, which I have seen from the 1950s, and then there's the one with Keanu Reeves that I've seen bits and pieces of, but I wanna see in full, um, or <laughs> Gary Oldman. I could have said the one with Gary Oldman, my first, my first thought was Keanu Reeves. I even have vampire teeth. I bought vampire teeth because I was considering doing a video about vampires and I might actually do it. I know it's not Halloween time, but I love scary spooky things and I'll talk about it whenever I want to. I'm sorry if I'm moving around a lot. I'm, I'm unable to be still. Thank you so much for watching. I hope somebody learned something from watching this and that hopefully this was interesting and maybe put Sleeping Beauty in a new light for you. Maybe it made it more interesting as a movie. Don't forget to like and subscribe. My next video will be watching the movie. Goodbye.